Hello friends, Jan Curcio. Welcome back to Breaking Bread for You with an examination of the book of Revelation chapter 19. John's vision of the second coming of Christ, coming on a white horse along with his heavenly army to defeat the beast, the false prophet, and the armies of the kings. We begin with John's vision of heaven rejoicing over the complete destruction of the great harlot, the city of the beast, through which the martyred saints begin to be avenged. Beginning in verse 1, John wrote, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And bear in mind that in the Bible, fornication most often refers to idol worship. And in verse 3 and 4, it says, Again they said, Alleluia! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen! Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And in verses 7 and 9, is expressed the long-awaited reason for their re rejoicing, where it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he, the angel, said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, if there is any indication in the book of Revelation that there will be a rapture of the church, which I have not found written, at least explicitly in the previous chapters, I believe it will take place between verses 5 and 7. Then John said, I fell at his feet to worship him, the angel. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. What John has done here in bowing down to the angel is idolatry, which evoked a sharp rebuke from the angel. Perhaps he included this episode knowing how easy it would be for believers to be deceived into worshiping idols. And angel worship was a problem in both Jewish and Gentile culture at that time. The book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 41 and 42, recalls the Hebrews' idol worshiping in the wilderness, where it says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of the angels of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And Paul warned the Corinthian church that even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11:14. Then the angel concludes by saying, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Perhaps what the angel meant here is to remind John that Jesus' testimony, that is, what he taught and preached, what he told the angel to give to John, is what he needs to be focusing on as a spirit-led prophet of God. And what we can walk away from this is that anything that takes precedent over worshiping and serving God in our lives is idolatry. Then John witnesses the most exciting thing in verse 11 where it says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Christ on his white horse is a contrast to the rider of the white horse in chapter 4 who comes to conquer with his bow, whether he is the Antichrist or merely a symbol of war. 
also Christ is not portrayed as the gentle slain lamb of God here, but as the fierce commander in chief of God who comes to slay the wicked. And John describes him in verse 12, where it says, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. Having many crowns is a picture of Christ's sovereignty over every nation of the world, which he comes to take. And in verse 12, or verse 12 concludes with, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Now in the ancient world, it was thought that there was power in one's name or the meaning of one's name, which may be why he withheld that name from everybody. So we can say that his new name will be revealed when he returns in power and glory. And in verse 13, it goes on to say, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. So it is to ask whose blood is on Christ's robe. He has just come from heaven, so we might think that the blood does not represent the enemies he is about to slay. Yet in looking for a precedent for this, we find in Isaiah 63, 3, where it says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger, and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. And since Christ fulfilled the Old Testament messianic prophecies, we can say that the blood on his robe symbolizes that of his slain enemies. Further expressed in verses 14 through 16 is Christ's fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy to strike down the nations, Isaiah 11, 3 and 5, and to rule with an iron rod, Psalm 2, 9. And Christ comes not alone and without a weapon, for it says in verses 14 and 15, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, two-edged sword in other translations, that with it he should strike the nations. Christ's weapon against the beast and his armies is his word. He creates and he destroys with nothing more than his word. And about the armies of heaven, it is not clarified whether they are angels or saints or both. Typically, the armies or hosts of heaven in scripture refer to angels. Yet given the context of chapter 19 and the mention of their fine white linen garments, it is more likely that they are the saints, specifically the martyred saints. Also, we will learn at the end of this chapter that Christ's army uses no weapons against the beast followers. Slaying the wicked is accomplished only by him. Then it goes on to say in verses 15 and 16, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Not only does ruling with an iron rod speak of Christ's reign on earth, when he will judge all evil in the world and crush all attempts at rebellion, but that his rule is unconquerable, uncompromising, and absolute. Also, there might be symbolic meaning uh, other than that to Christ's rod, most often taken to be the word of God. Like shepherds who pass a rod over a sheep's coat in order to evaluate the health of its skin, separating out the healthy from the inferior, Christ scrutinizes the spiritual condition of souls through his rod, the standard of his word, to separate out the saints from all others. And it continues to say, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Treading the winepress is a biblical euphemism for God's fierce judgment. And John concludes in verse 16, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Beginning in verse 17, John witnesses the fate of the corpses of the lost. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. 
Where it says the flesh of all people, it refers to those who will receive the mark of the beast and worship his image. Here, the supper of the great God forms a sharp contrast to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And note other significant contrasts in Revelation are Christ to the Antichrist, the beast followers to the saints, the beast religion to the true faith, and the lake of fire to the new heavens and earth. And beginning in verse 19, chapter 19 concludes with, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. But in spite of the beast's armies using the best of all the military weaponry at that time, they will fail. And in verses 20 and 21, it goes on to say, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mock of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Here we learn that it is Christ alone who slaughters the wicked. And it appears that there is no actual battle for it as military battles go. Since the battle against Satan and death was already fought and won at Calvary, all it will take is for Christ to return without lifting a finger to take the power away from the beast, the false prophet, the kings, and their armies. And about the lake of fire, there's no apparent metaphor with it, as some argue, since it says that they will be cast alive into the lake of fire. Being that it is the place of punishment, eternal punishment, for the beast and his followers indicates just how heinous rejecting Christ and following Satan is, and how justifiable that punishment will be. Although some think that a merciful God could not afflict such punishment on the loss, we must remember what God inflicted on his own beloved son on a cruel Roman cross in order to save mankind from that penalty. To reject Christ and his teachings and to kill his followers after all he suffered for their sake and for his ongoing efforts to reach out to the lost it is, is to deserve all that hell holds for them. It is a horrible thing that human beings made in the image of God are to perish as they will, but it is much worse that a God who has given them the opportunity of life eternal be hated, mocked, and rejected. It's made clear in Revelation 14 that the gospel will be broadcast by angels to all people during the Great Tribulation so that no one can say they had not heard the way to salvation. And that ends our study of Revelation 19. Thank you for viewing and be blessed in all that you do as you study God's word.